We can now move to the scientific program, finally, and it is really <clears throat> a great pleasure for me to be here today and to introduce the Nicole Lecture, this event, the first one uh, of the Congress, is also the most important lecture of the Congress. The invited speakers to the Nicole Lecture is decided in the International Association for Ambulatory Surgery Executive Committee meeting, and only the most outstanding personalities uh, that contributed to the advancement of ambulatory surgery in the world have been invited to give such a lecture in our biennial International Congress. Today is my privilege to invite Professor Beverly Phillips from Harvard Medical School to give a lecture on the path of ambulatory surgery, roots, trees, and stars. Beverly Phillips is the founding director of the day surgery unit at the Brigham and Women's Medical College in Hospital in, in Boston and Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard University. She received an, a undergraduate degree from Queens College City, University of New York, New York, and the medical uh, doctor degree from Upstate Medical Center, State University of New York, Syracuse, and completed the anesthesia residence at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, Harvard Medical School in Boston. Dr. Philip is active in research in ambulatory anesthesia, particularly in the pharmacology of new anesthetic agents. She has spoken uh, everywhere in the world as invited speaker to national and international congresses. She has published numerous research papers, review articles and books, chapters on various aspects on ambulatory anesthesia practice. Her many areas of interest are the pharmacology of inhaled and intravenous agents and the specialized administrative approaches to ambulatory surgery with uh, management skills including patient-focused, cost-effective care and facilitated fast-track recovery. She is a founding member and past president of the Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia, the most important uh, society in uh, U.S., dedicated to the subspeciality of ambulatory anesthesia. She has served as the chair of the Joint Commission's Ambulatory Healthcare Professional and Teaching Advisory Committee and is on the board of directors of and standard committee of the Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Health Care. She has also served on the CMS Advisory Panel and Ambulatory Payment Classification Groups. Dr. Phillips is the current chair of the Quality Management and Department and Administration Committee of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, past chair of the American Society of Anesthesiology Ambulatory Surgical Care Committee, and was chair of the Ambulatory Surgery Anesthesiology Annual Meeting for 2009. She is editor-in-chief of our international journal, Ambulatory Surgery. Dr. Philip is married and has two sons. Her spare time is also occupied with downhill telemark skiing, scuba diving, kayaking, dancing, and inline skating. She's a senior member of the National Ski Patrol and a certified inline skating instructor. Thank you, Beverly. Well, first, thank you. I want to thank IAS for the honor of this invitation. Thank specifically our IAS president, uh, Dr. Castoro, the president of the Congress and the Hungarian Ambulatory uh, Surgery Association, uh, Dr. Mohamed, and the chair of the International Scientific Committee, uh, Dr. Maria Janicko. And I want to acknowledge all the really illustrious previous presenters of the Nicol Lecture, some of which are in the audience today. So, to begin. To begin with our roots. This lecture begins with uh, James Nichol, for whom this is named after. He was a surgeon 
at the Glasgow Royal Hospital for Sick Children at 1899-1908 and performed eight, almost 9,000 operations, all outpatient, all children, most of them under three years of old. And he found some keys to success that are still very valid today. And these are some quotes from the notes he, he published afterwards that with a mother of average intelligence, assisted by advice from the hospital sister, the child fares better at home than in a hospital. And today, too, we think that families can comfortably give care to their perioperative family members if they get good education from the surgery uh, facility, from the nurses. He also noted that discrimination in choice of cases is also necessary. So the two, the other partner in ambulatory surgery is the physician who has to choose the appropriate patients. A third point he did make was that treatment of a large number of the cases at present treated indoors constitute a waste of resources. So from the beginning, we have a concern about the economy and the efficiency of care. On the other side, on our side of the uh, ocean, there was a spark of ambulatory surgery that uh, occurred. It was, this is Ralph Waters in Sioux City, Iowa, in the, uh, about 1920, who ran the downtown anesthesia clinic. He also had insight into what still makes ambulatory surgery a success. He did minor surgery, dental cases, under general anesthesia. And he noted that this was designed for both surgeons and patients who objected to going to the hospital because of the time and the expense involved. So we're talking about patient and surgeon convenience. And he also noticed in this newest and most central office building of the town, this has to be a first class operation. But in addition to the efficiency and the convenience of care, still the concern about the appropriate patient that the careful physical examination mu must be done on all suspicious risks. But after Nickel and after Waters, things not much happened for a while, until the 1960s, when there was long surgical lists started being, waiting lists started being developed. So simultaneously, in a number of countries, we saw the development of hospital-based ambulatory surgery units. The first one that published, that we have on record, was in Vancouver, Canada. After that, two in the United States, in uh, Southern California and in DC. And on, in, in England at Hammersmith, where they all recorded some outcomes about reducing waiting lists, saving the cost of a bed, the surgery itself being much less expensive. The real revolution in ambulatory surgery care came with the establishment of the Phoenix Surgery Center by uh, Wally Roard, uh, Reed and John Ford, which opened in 1970. Now, Wally Reed was one of the founding members of the Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia. And in 1988, he came to Sampa and he gave a lecture about how it all began. And I was fortunate to be there. For this occasion, he put together a book of mementos, photographs of his personal collection of what he did. And for those of you who are real history buffs, this is a page out of one of the books that he gave us at the time that I still have. What it says in the small type on the side there, that this is the first time the concept began to materialize on paper. He typed, 8, 1968. What you have here is his photograph of the dinner napkin he made his first sketch on. He was at the Smuggler's, not Smuggler's Inn restaurant with friends, and he made a sketch of a five-room operating area. And in the handwritten uh, words on the side, it says a separate waiting room for parents and a, an admitting from the room other than the recovery room. So this is the first documentation, this is his first documentation of what his plan was a few years before it actually got started. It's a fascinating book of materials. He wrote on the next page in, his, in his, this memento book about the objectives that he had going into this 1970 surgery center. The objective, to make the ambulatory patient a matter of greater concern, to streamline the delivery of their medical care, to reduce the cost of their medical care, 
and to work for a broadening of his or her insurance coverage. It is important to note that when Wally Reed and John Ford put this together, they had to fight to get reimbursement. Reimbursement was only being given in hospitals in those days because that was believed it was required for safe and effective care. He worked for a decade to get full insurance coverage for patients. So the beginning of ambulatory surgery, at least in the United States, was not about making a profit. It was truly about making the patient of concern streamlining the delivery of care, and the last point, to provide a pleasant atmosphere for both the patient, the staff, and the surgeon. So how did we get from Wally Reed's point to where, and particularly the U.S. is now, because we have some data on some of these. Let's look at what happened in the United States. And this is from a, a corporate marketing group, and the first study that uh, we have is from 1981. And this is percent of all U.S. surgery. And what you can see is that 80% of all surgery being done back in 1981 was hospital inpatient surgery. 20% was hospital outpatient surgery. What we call outpatient is they come in in the morning and go home the same working day. And a very small, a percent or two being done in surgery centers, FASC, and in, or in office-based facilities. But what happened in the early 1980s, 82, 83, was that the reimbursement system changed in the United States. And we've heard talk about incentives for the facility. The U.S. also instituted incentives for the surgeon, so that both the surgeon and the facility got paid the same amount, whether it took a long time to do them, keeping people overnight, or whether they only needed two or three hours of care and went home. And the care location flipped over a matter of months. You can see here between, uh, by 10 years later, from 1981 to 1991, we now have the hospital inpatient percent has dropped from 80% to 45%, and been essentially replaced by the growth of in and out surgery on the hospital outpatient basis. We're also seeing a small rise in the surgery center and office-based practice. Over the next decade, what you see is the trend continuing to roll and gather speed. The hospital inpatient has now dropped, not even 40%, maybe 20%, 23% of all surgery being done at this point. The hospital outpatient, steady, at about 45%. The growth now is occurring first in the surgery center, more recently in the office space, taking up the entire slab. So what has happened, and this trend is simply continuing. What has happened here, starting in 1981, U.S. was doing 20 million procedures, 80% inpatient, 20% total outpatient. I was fortunate enough to set up my unit back in 1980 because it seemed like a really good idea, but we were watching all of this happen. You go to 2006, now instead of 20 million, there are 50 million surgical procedures being done in the United States, and only 16% of it is being done hospital inpatient, and 83% as, as of 2006 data being done going home within a matter of hours of their surgery. It's been a big change. So what has driven the growth of ambulatory surgical care? First, it has been surgeons like Nickel, anesthesiologists like Wally Reed, the physicians interested in raising the quality of care. It had to do with surgeons developing experience with caring for patients who were going to go home in a few hours and success with that experience. It was about physician convenience and satisfaction, about patient convenience and satisfaction. The patients come back and ask for this kind of care. There certainly was a growth in technical factors, both the surgical technology, the changing in anesthesia drugs, and vast improvements in our ways to manage post-operative pain and post-operative nausea. Later came the cost incentives. So what was in it for the hospitals? They saved money. For those parts of our healthcare system in the U.S. who are profit-based, ambulatory surgery centers and offices 
they have profits. But I like to look at this from the point of view of the healthcare system overall. The healthcare system wins either way. Either they save money overall, because ambulatory surgical care is so much less expensive, or for the same money, you get to treat a lot more patients. Either way, the healthcare system nationally wins. So where are we now? And we are now in a forest of very, very strong trees, uh, overshadowing any individual practice entirely. There, we, the best data we have out of the United States is from our federal government. Every 10 years, they perform a census, and it's done by the Census Department uh, of Ambulatory Surgical Care. And it's a very uh, formal, structured, statistical design. They look at hospitals and freestanding surgery centers, uh, general adult and pediatric cases, and across different geographic reasons, regions. And they do a systematic sampling of these ambulatory surgery sites. The data is collected every 10 years, about, and it takes another three years to try to digest all that they collect. What did they find? This is uh, the first we have here is the number of ambulatory surgery visits and discharges and the other pair of columns of procedures in the United States looking at 1996, the previous survey, versus the most recent one. And you can see on the left that the blue, which represents the inpatient percentage of uh, visits being done is constant over those 10 years. The growth is clearly in the red part, the outpatient procedures. On number of procedures there, we have, again, the growth is not on the inpatient side, only on the outpatient side, where by 2006, almost 62% in this sample are outpatient for a total of 53 million procedures. It's important to remember that this only includes hospitals and freestanding surgery centers meeting some of their selection criteria. This does not include any of the office-based practice at all. So we find that it is overall 52%. Now looking at the distribution of the ambulatory surgery visits, 60% hospital-based, 42% uh, 43% freestanding ambulatory surgery centers. And we've watched the number of freestanding ambulatory centers grow. If you look, look back into the historical data, the reports, we had our first one back in 1970. Five years later, there are 42. Another half a decade later on, we're up to 239. Currently, what we see is there, as of 2010, there are over 5,000 freestanding ambulatory surgery centers in the United States. And this is only the ones that are receiving money payment from the federal government, so it specifically excludes the entire range of cosmetic surgery. We also looked at the number of patient visits by facility type. The blue is the hospital-based uh, visits. The growth is, again, in the freestanding number of visits, 300% increase over the 10 years. We also see that there is a, a similar distribution among genders. This is the columns of all ages and gender by decades. And while women have, tend to have more procedures, except at the very ends of age, it is across the breadth of our population. We also find that when people are going for surgical care, they have often more than one procedure done while they're there. The large blue uh, part of the uh, pie is having one procedure done. The larger pink one is then having two procedures done and other people with higher numbers. We learned some other, fa one other fascinating point is in fact that as to no surprise, validating that the freestanding surgery centers are more efficient operations. And this is one of the very few data points that actually shows this in addition to the claims. So we have here out of this census, that if you look at OR times, the typical, uh, not typical, the, the average case was 60 minutes in a hospital-based facility, 43 minutes in a freestanding. This does not mean they're doing the same procedure. There's a somewhat difference in case mix as well, but you have a difference here. 
uh, surgery time itself, 34 minutes, 25 minutes, recovery, 79 versus 53, but the overall stay, 146 minutes down to 97 minutes for the freestanding surgery centers. But I want to also point out that even at our slow end, at the hospital-based units, patients are going home in a couple of hours. This is two and a half hours to discharge in the hospital-based units. Our patients, while we, there is some reimbursement for overnights, there, there's no additional reimbursement for overnight stay in the US. You can keep people overnight, but whether you keep them for this two hours or 23 hours, it's the same payment. So we actually, patients really do go home. I'd also point out that we actually don't have uh, recovery hotels. I know this is in the literature. There was, an ex there was a demonstration project the federal government tried, and it didn't save any money. Made some profit for the people who owned it, but did not save any money. They are not paid, and they, they essentially don't exist in the United States at this time. Patients are going home. Now, there actually is some data from Europe as well. This is a performance assessment tool for hospitals, a quality improvement program that was set up by uh, WHO here in Europe. And they looked at a number of tracer procedures, day surgery procedures, including procedures such as arthroscopy, hernia, TNA, cholecystectomy, vein stripping. What did they find? What is going on in Europe now as well? This data is within the European Union, comparing multiple countries, looking at inguinal hernia repair. And what you can see is that there is a rather astounding difference in the whether patients are done as inpatients or outpatients for what we see as a simple procedure, inguinal hernia repair. In country, anonymous country number two, we have an incidence that is maximum 20%, mostly not done outpatient at all, our post and in comparison to number three where the average is about 80 percent instead fascinating no data from no explanation from this from the uh hospital from this path program they also looked at within individual countries looking at the same procedures the third one from the left is again hernia repair and we see that looking within one country that the range of procedures being done, the, the percentage of ambulatory still varies widely. Now, if you're talking from here, from three to 44%. So it can't be, while the first slide can be explained by different payment systems, here that there's a big difference either in payment or in difference in the population is less believable. There are simply local practices that govern these differences not based on other external evidence phenomena. Co international comparisons that actually identify countries so you can have a guess on what is actually going on are very few. The best one comes out of the IAAF, and we've had an international survey on ambulatory surgery that Dr. Tufgard has been uh, uh, shepherding for a number of years now. And this is a survey of IAS members. It's a basket of 37 surgical procedures that has been constant since 2000, so we can see the change as it happens. And it specifically includes both common procedures, such as cataracts and colon polyp removals, and more cutting edge kind of procedures, such as, uh, well, at least in Europe, hernia repair, lap coli, and disc surgery. Uh, the survey records the number of inpatients, the number of outpatients, the total number of surgical procedures, and some additional descriptive information on the organization of the system and our reimbursement. So what does, uh, what does the IAS survey show? Looking at Ingu the same inguinal hernia repair, we have now idea on where is this all different? So you can see that in Germany or Scotland, the incidence is somewhere in the 5% range of outpatient. We're not so far away in uh, Denmark or Sweden, we have above 80%. Very differences, clearly not based on patient-based differences. Looking at a more common procedure, cataract, most countries do, do most of these as outpatients, but there are still Germany, Portugal, Scotland, 
where even these patients are kept in hospital. Fascinating information. So, we've seen something about how many procedures done. It's important to wrap that up with one other point, which is we need to do, are we also doing a good job? Doing a lot is not to the point, unless we're doing a good job of lot cases. And we need to keep track of patient outcomes, look at those outcomes in comparison by benchmarking, and put that benchmarking into a quality improvement program. This has to go on first at the individual facility level. And for those of you who are still setting up programs, this is the time to set up with your program a quality improvement outcome data. It certainly is in some extent and needs to be done more by the regional and national governments. But there are other places that you can look for data. There are quality organizations. The most obvious one are the accrediting organizations of which we have several, uh, DNV, uh, the Triple HC, uh, the Joint Commission, and another uh, and the Quad ASF. And I have a star next to the last one, because they, this, is the, uh, this is the plastic surgeon office-based group, and they have, from the beginning, required data submission that they do, and have, have reported this from time to time as well. The other one, where I think there's more growth and more specific data to be had is many of our professional societies are now uh, creating and collecting data registries. The ASA has an, uh, is developed about five years now an anesthesia registry that we will start be getting some data out of. The Society for Ambulatory Anesthesia has a much more granular looking at details from the ambulatory surgery patient surgical and anesthesia experience. The American College of Surgeons has their own database out of another quality improvement program. All of these, what they have, to, uh, some do to varying degrees, what they all should include is information about the surgery, about the anesthesia, about administrative issues, and about how did the patient view this experience, patient satisfaction. Can you advance the slide? I, I, I'm glad to tell you when to advance. That's okay. Great. So to continue, now we've seen where we are now and what data we are collecting now. We want to look now onward and upward. Next. This is a partial knee replacement that is being done not only outpatient, but, is also, but in surgery centers that specialize in orthopedic outpatient surgery. And this is a quote from their website, once reserved for elderly patients, this is now common in younger active population. This is specific marketing to the patient. And that is a phenomenon that is coming out now because if an individual has sore knees, they certainly don't want to be considered elderly. They would like to think of themselves as young and active. Very good marketing. Next slide, please. This is single incision laparoscopic surgery. I have here two pictures from one of the training manuals. On the left, you can see the umbilicus with a small plastic uh, disc through which that is a five millimeter scope going through and the insufflating line on the left. On the right is a view from inside the abdomen where you can see uh, a retractor bending up and several of the operative instruments working out of the same hole. We do, uh, laparoscopic surgery with only one incisional site. Next slide. Next slide.
There's also been advances in, there are developing advances in education of surgeons and anesthesiologists and nurses in the new technology. Virtual reality training. This is part of a simulation trainer for robotic surgery. And on the upper slide, you can see what you, the surgeon practice is doing in a uh, 3D virtual reality with the curve of the inside of the back of the abdomen practice, picking up uh, uh, small balls and putting them on the platform. That's called basic pick and place. When the surgeon has that down, back please. Thank you. When the surgeon puts gets the basic activities done, they then move on to the advanced, where now you have a large ball on a small pole that you have to learn to pick up and carefully balance. And uh, these virtual reality trainers have been evaluated by surgeons who are already good at this clinically, and they say this is really outstanding training for what it is in the real world. Next. There is also image-guided surgery that's being developed. And this is the robotic, a robotic brain biopsy, where we have a surgical robot. And that is the blue, the two blue uh, controllers on the left with a needle biopsy to biopsy that green lesion that you can see there in green. This is actually a patient happening real time. The patient goes for a 3D uh, modeling, and you can see some of the pictures along the bottom. They make a volumetric image, and as the needle is robotically controlled to remove some of the tumor, the shape of the rest of the brain and the tumor changes. So there are real-time volumetric updates in exactly where the tumor is and where the rest of the brain is. And the lesion can be precisely taken out as it's needed. We also have seen advances in anesthesia. What we have now is target-controlled anesthesia. We are using representatives for, the, for anesthetic depth in the body to try to aim for the target of anesthesia depth we want, and this is available both for intravenous and inhaled drugs now. But you know, the surgical technology and all the anesthetic drugs are just not the limiting factor for the growth of ambulatory surgery. The real limits of ambulatory surgery are, as you've all suspected by now, administrative. And this is some research that was done in Europe uh, reflecting the conditions here. That they found where the major determinant internationally on the growth of ambulatory surgery was the between country differences in healthcare funding. And they looked inside the countries first look at patient characteristics. Most people say, well, my patients don't want or they aren't ready for it or they're not healthy enough. That's just not it. The one thing, every time it's been researched, it is never a matter of patient acceptance. What they did find, that it's largely due to organizational constraints at the hospital level. We don't want to change the way we're doing it. Uh, clinicians' lack of awareness of practice norms Surgeons and anesthesiologists not un and nurses not understanding that patients can and do do better in an ambulatory care environment. And also, clinical barriers raised by surgeons who don't perceive day surgery as advantageous to them. And this is where I think the U.S. system forked and why it worked, has worked faster for us is that our surgeons are included in the incentive program. They have learned that instead of counting hospital beds as a matter of advantage, you can count on the number of operations you can get done as the advantage instead. And once the surgeons in particular are convinced that the ambulatory surgery is, and I'm quoting the literature, advantageous to them, they tell the patients, the patients that they're going to, patients are going to do well with ambulatory surgery. The patients say, sure we will. The patients always accept. We need us, we the healthcare providers, to be convinced about it because the patients want it. Patients would rather be well than sick. They'd rather be home than stuck in a hospital. So how can we make this surgery happen? And here I again 
of bringing in our organization, IAS, with a, with a policy brief led by Dr. Castoro about day surgery making it happen. So these are the IAS's 10 key recommendations in making ambulatory surgery happen. And it's not philosophical. This is real practical process issues. You have to change the process of care. One, consider day surgery rather than inpatient surgery the norm for elective procedures. Next, separate the flow of day surgery patients from inpatients. Healthy patients having minor procedures do not like to look at post-surgical patients after major operations. It's not pleasant. We have to design day surgery facilities according to local needs, structurally separate from inpatient facilities wherever possible. And I can tell you then some of the more third world places I have gone and visited where people do not have clean running water and have come for long distances, you only need to provide a dormitory nearby to stay where they and their family can stay overnight. It doesn't require a hospital bed. These patients are well. Four, provide day surgery units with independent management structures, dedicated nursing staff, tremendously important for dedicated nursing staff, and take advantage of motivated surgeons and anesthesiologists to lead the change. Esque achieve economies by ensuring that expansion of day surgery facilities are accompanied by reductions in inpatient capacity. To that, I would add, or consider that you are, want to take care of more patients with the same amount of money that you were treating few before. Have to invest in educational programs for the hospital, for the community, remove regulatory economic banner, barriers, align economic incentives, and quality assurance, monitor and provide feedback on patient results. So what is the future of ambulatory surgery? I think first and foremost, it's the team approach. We work in this together. Here we have the nurses and the physicians. Around that is a ring of technical support staff. With that, administrative functions, all of which are focused on the dedicated, specialized care for the ambulatory surgery patient. Where do we go from here? A while back, I wrote an editorial with Bert Epstein that many of you will remember. And some things, again, don't change terribly much over time. What is the future of ambulatory surgery. Our primary goal for ambulatory surgery care is the safe care of a satisfied patient. And that still sums it up very precisely. Safe care of a satisfied patient. By doing that, we improve the quality and the efficiency of the health care in all our countries. To meet this goal, we need to explore and question and continually question all aspects of the care we provide. Do we provide too much care? But well, we also have to be careful not to provide too little care. It's not the numbers, it's also the quality. As the specialty, specialty of ambulatory surgery continues to grow, the challenges continue to grow and they continue to change. The challenges that Wally Reed had at the Phoenix Surgery Center are not the ones that you and I are facing today, but they continue to be challenges. So let's look past those trees that are our past and our present towards the stars in the sky that are the future. And there are a lot of really bright ideas out there that we could strive for. But I think we who do ambulatory surgery are actually very practical people. And stars in the sky is not where we want to go. We want to get moving on the change of ambulatory surgery. We want a new dawn, we want a new day, and we want the opportunity together as teams to move forward to improve the quality of healthcare. Thank you very much.